it's not a hard calculation to double CO2 and see what it does to global mean temperature if you hold everything else fixed. It gives you about one degree centigrade, which is not a big deal. Right. Some people argue a tenth of a degree is a big deal, but that's nonsense. Uh, models, on the other hand, commonly give you three, four degrees. What's happening in those models, and I'm saying in the models, not nature, is the main greenhouse substances, water vapor and clouds, are behaving so as to take anything man does and make it much worse. But there is a problem with that picture. Apart from the fact that I think it's untrue, and our own studies are showing that. But the problem is, and this is what people don't realize, I'm talking about doubling carbon dioxide, but the important thing for climate is how much it imbalanced the radiative transfer. If we ask how much in the way of CO2 and methane has been added to the atmosphere in the last century and what percentage of the greenhouse perturbation is compared to doubling CO2 it's three quarters in other words in terms of greenhouse effect we're three quarters of the way to a doubling already and our alarm is based on models that are saying uh, we should see for a doubling three, four degrees. The most conservative, two and a half. And we've seen a half. And we can't even say that's due to men. Well, Greenland wasn't named Greenland because it was white. It was named Greenland because the margins of it were green when the Vikings colonized it. One unfortunate thing about our thermometer record is it basically starts at the coldest part of the Little Ice Age back in the mid-19th century, about 150 years ago. And so if our temperature record starts at the coldest period we've seen in probably 10,000 years and is warming up out of that, you would expect that the most recent periods should be the warmest, naturally. Temperature goes up, temperature goes down, it's hardly ever standing still, at least not at the level of tenths of the degree, which we're talking about. And every time it's going one way or the other, society has responded by saying it's going to continue going. Every time it's turned around. So we had warming concerns in the late 30s, when for many areas of the world, including the Arctic, it warmed more than it did today. Then we had mild cooling uh, from the 40s to the 70s, which incidentally, when you looked at the published records, looked much more profound then than it does in the records we're see shown today. But nevertheless, <clears throat> then they had global cooling. And there was all sorts of hysteria and time and Newsweek <clears throat> about man's emissions were going to give rise to so-called aerosols and they were going to cool the earth, and we'd go into an ice age. And then that turned around, and we had warming, and now we have had for 20 years, actually more, 25 years, am I wrong? Yeah, something like that, 20 years, at least. Um, declarations that if we don't act now, the end of the world is nigh. You know, I'm sure people are tiring of this after 20 years, People should understand that the climate system always changes. The temperature of the planet is always rising or falling. Glaciers are always expanding or retracting. And think about this. If you had a choice between receding glaciers and advancing glaciers, you would want receding glaciers because nobody wins when there's advancing glaciers. The most common failing I find is in the selective use of evidence. Uh, people, perhaps naturally, tend to reject evidence that contradicts their favorite theory or hypothesis. It's quite common. Uh, it's now been institutionalized in the following sense. Take the IPCC, for example, the UN 
panel on climate change. They write fairly decent reports. The reports typically are 800 to 1,000 pages without index. Nobody can read them, really, unless you, like myself, uh, unless you're one of the reviewers and you have read through the report. And then a small group of government scientists gets together and writes a summary for policymakers. The ones that I've seen are very selective. They reject evidence that would cast any doubt on human causes of global warming. And naturally then they come up with statements like there's evidence for human causes of global warming. They have to be careful because the report itself doesn't say that. But you can word the summary in such a way as to suggest that the preponderance of evidence or the balance of evidence suggests human causes. And that's what they do. I have long argued that instead of a summary for policymakers, we need a policy for summary makers. Oftentimes, the summaries are much more strident and definitive than the following text. I think that's quite clear in the third assessment report. But there's also some very strange things that happen in, in the making of the overall reports. Uh, in the one that's on the table right now, in early draft, there was a wonderful illustration showing all the, it's, a, it's like a, a table with lines on it, that showed all the places around the earth for the last 11,000 years where it had been warmer than it was prior to the Industrial Revolution, somewhere back between now and 11,000 years ago. And right up on the top, near the north end of this thing, was a big streak that indicated about four degrees Fahrenheit warmer for Siberia and North Russia and North Eurasia from about 3,500 years ago to 11,000 years ago. 7,000 years plus where it was warmer. And it had the reference in the scientific literature where it came from, McDonald et al., from the geography department at UCLA. When the next draft came around, it was missing. It was gone. Everybody knows this guy's work. We called him up. Hey, did somebody like refute your work on the tree line? No. Why did it disappear? I haven't a clue. The IPCC is not peer reviewed in, in the strict sense because in the IPCC, the people that write the thing get to decide what reviews they want to listen to. In other words, if they don't like what somebody said, eh, we don't necessarily have to pay attention to that. In a letter to the Wall Street Journal, Professor Frederick Seitz, former president of America's National Academy of Sciences, revealed that IPCC officials had censored the comments of scientists. He said that, This report is not the version that was approved by the contributing scientists. At least 15 key sections of the science chapter had been deleted. These included statements like, None of the studies cited have shown clear evidence that we can attribute climate changes to increases in greenhouse gases. No study to date has positively attributed all or part of the observed climate changes to man-made causes. Professor Seitz concluded, I have never witnessed a more disturbing corruption of the peer review process than the events that led to this IPCC report. When I resigned from the IPCC, I thought that was the end of it. But when I saw the final draft, my name was still there, so I asked for it to be removed. Well, they told me that I had contributed, so it would remain there. So I said, no, I haven't contributed, because they haven't listened to anything I've said. So in the end, it was quite a battle. But finally, I threatened legal action against them, and they removed my name. And I think this happens a great deal. Those people who are specialists but don't agree with the polemic, and resign, and there have been a number that I know of, uh, they are simply put on the author list and become part of this 2,500 of the world's top scientists.